I want to talk to you about how video games, all of them, lie to you about archaeology. I don't just mean how Nathan Drake and Laura Croft and Indiana Jones are bad archaeologists, which, of course, they are. I mean that pretty much every time a video game has shown a character visiting an archaeological site, they've lied to you. Now, I'm not talking like the Assassin's Creed games. Those games depict ancient places in ancient times with varying degrees of success. Instead, I'm talking any time a game shows a character today visiting any sort of ancient place. That's when the lies really go down. So what does this realization do for us here in this little series? It gives us an opportunity to talk a little about archaeological method. That's right, folks. Today, we're going to learn about some more big dumb words that will be totally useless to you unless you are at a fancy cocktail party or you quit your job tomorrow and start shovel rumbling your way to glory. After I introduce some big brain ideas, we'll move towards making those ideas a little bit more concrete by showing you some examples from one of the biggest archaeological liars in video games, the Uncharted series. So let's start where I seem to always start, with an unbelievably pretentious and ultimately unanswerable question. Turns out, though, meditating on this is kind of important if we want to consider the ways games represent ancient places. What is history, anyway? And by extension, how do video games go about depicting history? What sorts of shortcuts and cheap tricks do they use to make history seem significantly more interesting than perhaps it would appear at first blush? Let's start with defining history. For one thing, history is not an object. It isn't an artifact, much to the chagrin of archaeologists. It's not a shirt of ceramic that we can take out of the ground, measure, weigh, or analyze its colors. We can't scientifically pull it apart or analyze its matrix to tell how it was made or what it was made of. History is not something that we can sensorily experience, at least not directly. History is a series of narratives, narratives that become history because we generally agree that those narratives are true. To explore what I mean, let's jump into a wild hypothetical. How do we know that the Revolutionary War actually happened? Take a second with that question. How do we really know that it happened? Not one of us was alive to experience it firsthand. There are probably only a handful of people alive today who even remember the start of the 20th century. Actually, I just looked it up, and the oldest well-documented living person ever was Jean-Louis Calment, a French woman who lived to 122 and a half years old. That would mean even she, she died in 1997, if she were living today, would just barely make the cut of living in the 1800s. A little aside, of course, five seconds of Googling reveals how complicated trying to determine the oldest person ever is. Some folks seem to think Calmont was a fraud and wasn't really that old. There are other, possibly older people, who are not as well documented as Calmont and so maybe aren't getting the credit they deserve. The credit for uh, not dying for the longest amount of time? Okay, okay, back to our big brain hypothetical. Not one person on this planet actually experienced the events of the Revolutionary War. Not even anyone's great-grandparents were alive to see it. So how do we really know it happened? Well, we know that it happened because the people who did experience it told their children, and those children told their children, and some of those people wrote down what happened on little pieces of pulped up trees. As archaeologists, sometimes we can go to the locations of battles from the Revolutionary War, and we can find some bits and bobs that were dropped, and we can use those artifacts to confirm the stuff that folks wrote down on the little pulped up bits of trees. Sometimes, archaeology can reveal that the things people wrote on bits of pulped up trees were lies, or misconceptions, or embellishments. With time, people accept a certain telling of the events as written down on pulped up pieces of trees. We may argue over the nuances and details, but the fact that it happened stops being generally doubted. And so, history is not a thing. It's not a hard, fast object. It's an agreed-upon narrative, a series of ideas that we choose to believe en masse. So to pretend that we are doing an archaeology or history is making a bunch of perfectly scientific, material-based observations and just recording them as they exist, I think this sort of misses the point. So how does this connect back to games? Games that are interested in representing a depth of time, especially those that are particularly focused on representing either historical periods or the remains of those historical periods, lie to us. They pretend that the past is more materially relevant in the present than it actually is. They play a little fast and loose with archaeological representations. This creates a problem for archaeologists who want to talk about the past and how we actually experience it in the present. It gives the impression that the past can be perfectly known, and that it can be perfectly known simply by looking at the stuff people left behind and using our common sense. Turns out, that is very far from the truth. There is, in fact, a wide gulf between how games and other types of media represent ancient places as they appear in the present day. 
There are, frankly, a whole lot of gaps between the past and the observable present within the archaeological record. We, as archaeologists, fill in those gaps with narrative, exactly the same way historians do. We do it with interpretive theory, rigorous method, and honest humility about the limitations of our science. Unfortunately, that does not constitute good storytelling in a video game. So out the door with it, thank you very much. Games tell us beautiful lies. They do this for earnest, laudable reasons, to entertain, to educate, and to exhilarate us. I don't want to give you the impression that these lies are evil, or even that they usually have ill intent, although sometimes they do. Most of the time, game makers tell us lies about archaeology in order to better immerse us in their stories. If everyone needed at least a bachelor's degree in anthropology to enjoy an Indiana Jones movie or a Tomb Raider game, no one would play them or watch them, except the weirdos who take my classes. And almost no one would be inspired by the exciting stories they tell about a mythical past. Nonetheless, we can all stand to have a little more knowledge about this process, and frankly, knowing a little bit about what an archaeological site actually looks like makes playing games that represent ancient places more fun, not less so. So today, we're going to do something a little different from previous episodes. Rather than talking about theory or ethics, the two legs of the discipline stool that I've discussed previously, we'll be tackling method. Remember that method, or methodology, is the way that a science is done. Not the way we think about the data, or the way we interpret the data, but the actual physical steps a scientist takes to observe that data. The two fun archaeological terms we're going to learn about today are preservation and taphonomy. Fun, right? Get your cocktail party hat on, because we're about to take a journey into Nerdsville. First though, let me introduce the game series we'll be analyzing today. You've already been seeing clips of the games for the last several minutes, but in case you don't recognize them, we're talking about the Uncharted series. Uncharted is a four-game series produced by Naughty Dog. That's the same company that makes The Last of Us. The Last of Us is like the Citizen Kane of video games. Unlike The Last of Us, which is the rear window of video games, Uncharted is a dumb popcorn adventure for big dumb dummies like me. And unlike The Last of Us, which is of course the Shawshank Redemption of movies, which is of course the, Sha the, the Shawshank Redemption of video games, let me take it a little aside here. For reasons I don't understand, every time that I wrote the blank movie of video games joke, I accidentally wrote archaeology instead of video games, and so I had to re-record myself saying those lines about 55 times. Uncharted stars fellow big dumb dummy Nathan Drake, a treasure hunter dude with big biceps, quippy quips, a love of ancient treasures, and a need to kill. He speaks like 20 languages, can read ancient Greek and Latin, went to Catholic school, loves pirates, loves Tibet, loves the desert, hates getting blown up by grenades, and never has to worry about archaeological site formation processes. Uncharted is mostly a game about shooting guys in body armor, and occasionally about standing in elaborate puzzle trap rooms waiting for the game to let you push up on the d-pad for a hint that just tells you where to stand and push the triangle button. Unfortunately, Uncharted will never be the vertigo of movies. I did it again. Unfortunately, Uncharted will never be the vertigo of video games. They are fun though. You shoot a lot of dudes in body armor. Uncharted 4 literally has a gag trophy called Ludo Narrative Dissonance for killing 1,000 dudes. I got the hell out of that trophy. Ostensibly though, Drake is meant to be a treasure hunter in the same vein as Lara Croft, Indiana Jones, and every archaeologist born before 1947. Your goal in the Uncharted games is often to literally loot archaeological sites, usually in the service of various overcomplicated plot machinations. The problem comes in how these archaeological sites are represented. This is where the makers of Uncharted, and all the games and movies that inspired it, outright lie to us. Let's do a case study to explore this phenomenon. This is a particularly egregious example from Uncharted 4. Uncharted 4 is a great game, by the way, and I think you should still play it. So I won't spoil it by telling you what this place is supposed to be. It's not really important where it is. We can tell it's in a jungle, and we can tell it's supposed to be some sort of town from the 17th or 18th century. This setting is actually relatively recent for an ancient place represented in an Uncharted game, so it's ironic perhaps that it's maybe the most blatant example of the archaeological lies perpetrated by these types of games. This is a great location to teach you about both preservation and taphonomy. Let's start with preservation. Preservation is the process by which an object left behind in the past survives or does not survive into the present. In other words, preservation is how an artifact becomes an artifact through the passage of time. So, preservation is the general process through which any artifact is or is not preserved by the natural and cultural processes inherent to the passage of time. A lot of factors go into this, and every type of material has different preservational qualities. 
For instance, stone objects tend to preserve extremely well, since stones tend to be already millions of years old before a human turns them into an artifact by interacting with or modifying them. In contrast, fabric preserves extremely poorly, because it's usually made of organic material that's prone to all sorts of destructive post-depositional processes. So first thing to consider when determining a state of preservation is material. Is the material one that will survive the test of time or not? This matters a lot in terms of our interpretation, because no matter what, an archaeological site is likely to produce far more artifacts of materials that preserve well, like stone tools and ceramics, and far fewer artifacts of materials that do not preserve well, like fabrics, bone, or plant matter. The next factor to consider when measuring preservation is artifact context. In general, some artifacts will preserve no matter where they are deposited. Again, stone tools are the ultimate example of this. Are you starting to get an inkling of why stone tools are so important to archaeologists? As a result of this phenomenon, we tend to overinterpret the importance of stone tools because we almost always find them. Unlike stone tools or ceramics, most artifact materials need some sort of exceptional preservational circumstance in order to survive. There are a number of these, but I'll introduce you to three. The first is desiccation. Desiccation is when an object is removed of all or nearly all of its moisture. This can happen naturally in very dry environments like deserts, caves, and rock shelters. And it can also be the result of the cultural practice of mummification. Mummification, of course, is when one removes all of the moisture and the wet organs from a body after death in order to preserve it through the process of desiccation. Many scholars, in fact, think that ancient Egyptian mummification may have been first inspired by natural examples happening in the local arid environments of Northern Africa. Interestingly, the opposite is also true. Another way that artifacts can become preserved is through waterlogging, especially in very cold water. Waterlogged sites can sometimes have unbelievable preservation. Some great examples of this come from Northern Europe, where incredibly rare finds made of wood with preserved paint and other decoration have been found in submerged archaeological sites. Another good example is the site of Monteverde in southern Chile, likely one of the oldest archaeological sites in the whole of the Western Hemisphere, at between 14 and 18,000 years old. Monteverde was partially waterlogged beneath a river for thousands of years and now has archaeological features and objects, including bones and wood, that would never survive a normally buried or open-air site of that age. Charring is the third and probably most common form of exceptional preservation. Unlike with desiccation and waterlogging, which often affect whole sites, charring is often present in elements of sites, specifically and preserved features. Archaeological features are like artifacts that cannot be removed from a site in total. Things like fire pits, hearths, storage middens, stuff like that. Anyway, charring often affects very specific artifacts that find themselves in a fire for some reason. And by luck, these tend to be the kinds of artifacts that don't preserve normally, like wood, seeds, other plant parts, bones, and even occasionally fabrics. One of the reasons archaeologists are so interested in features is because they can yield these rare artifact types, which can in turn tell us a whole lot about people's diets and other important aspects of their lives. So what do all these exceptional preservational circumstances have in common? In one way or another, they prevent the breakdown of organic materials by discouraging microbes and sometimes, like with charring, more complex animals like rodents. This significantly limits the effects of something called a natural transform. Now, we get to apply our new knowledge of preservation to the slightly larger topic of taphonomy. Another name for taphonomy is site formation processes. Taphonomy is the study of how an archaeological site comes to exist beneath the surface of our feet. How does an archaeological site go from the location of a lived experience, say a village, house, battlefield, public bath, ziggurat, whatever, into the buried bits and bobs that we excavate as archaeologists? This is an immensely complex process, and it's not one we ever hope to fully understand at a given site. Learning as much as we can about taphonomy gives us the tools we need to interpret our findings with the greatest possible accuracy and precision. Like I said before, taphonomy is really, really complicated, so let me just give you the true basics. Imagine an archaeological site as it may have existed in the past, let's say 5,000 years ago. It's a dynamic place, with people and animals moving from place to place, fluidly living their lives, and using the space for various activities. People interact with one another in myriad ways, prepare and eat food, teach and learn, produce new objects and discard of old ones. They live and worship, sleep and wake, then they leave. The vernacular in archaeology for this is to say the site is abandoned. The site exists for this single moment in time, untouched and pristine. I don't know if there's a name for this, but when teaching this phenomenon, I often, I often call this the site's historical state. Immediately, and I do mean immediately, after the site is abandoned, it begins to transform. Many of these transformations will be natural, meaning they come from the forces of nature. 
plants and trees will grow through the site, and animals will come looking for food. Microbes will begin working away at organic materials. These zoonomic forces will almost always target the most preservationally susceptible artifacts first. The forces of nature will continue to alter the site over the years, decades, centuries, and millennia to come. New waterways may work their way through, earthquakes, frost heaves, tree falls, storms, and floods, and sometimes the smallest of forces can cause the most change. Research has shown that earthworms, for instance, can cause immense shifts in a site's makeup when working over many years. But these natural changes are usually only half the story. There are also the forces carried out by people. We call these cultural transformations. Someone may trample over a sheep midden, crushing up the ceramics and bones into smaller fragments. Years later, new people might come and create a new site on top of the old one, creating a palimpsest of artifacts and often truncating older features. This creates what is called a multi-component site, but also actively disturbs our original hypothetical site. Then, of course, in the modern period, we have built cities and towns and neighborhoods and streets and subways and all manner of utilities that crisscross across the landscape, intersecting and impacting archaeological sites of all ages. What's left at the end of all this? Again, there isn't precisely a term for that, but I'll call it the site's archaeological state. This is effectively where site formation processes end. At this point, the site is formed as it exists immediately before we put a trowel or a shovel or a pulse of ground penetrating radar into the soil. That's, unfortunately, not the end of the story, though. The method of our excavation also affects how much of a site is captured by the archaeologists. Archaeological excavation is inherently destructive. We destroy sites as we study them. We mitigate this by carefully controlling for space and meticulously recording, drawing, and measuring everything that we find. Nonetheless, the limitations of our skill, resources, and time mean that a good portion of a site will either be destroyed without being recorded or will never be excavated at all. Furthermore, the decisions we make about which objects are artifacts, and thus worthy of collecting and cataloging, and which are not, further filters the historical and archaeological states. I call the information that remains after this final filtering the effective state, or more simply, it's all of the collected data. We can even go a little bit further and point out that a great deal of archaeological data is never published or reported in a meaningful way, and think of this as a further filtration of the archaeological record. If we do consider all of these steps, funneling the reality of our 5,000-year-ago site into the Excel spreadsheet at the end of a report in a scholarly journal, we recognize that the archaeological record itself represents but a tiny fraction of the real McCoy. How do we go about interpreting past human behavior and culture from such a tiny subset of information? Well, that's a topic for a future video. So let's bring it back once more to our case study, Uncharted. Let's first consider this scene with what we know now about preservation. Are there any exceptional preservational qualities at work here? The site's not dry or waterlogged or charred in any meaningful way, nor would it be preserved in any other special way I didn't mention. In fact, a hot, wet environment like the Caribbean tropics is probably an especially poor location for preservation. How about our site formation process? Like in so many of the locations discussed, we've seen during this video, this archaeological site is exposed to the open air. This is most certainly not typical. It also means that every bit of material we see would be open to every form of natural and cultural transformation one could imagine. Short of a giant city being built atop this place, something I've experienced firsthand in much of my own work, this site would have seen it all. So what would have survived here? To be frank, almost nothing. Ropes, wood, iron, literal freaking handwritten notes on paper just sitting on tables, all would be completely gone. Some of these things might appear as subsurface features that would require careful excavation and a trained eye to even recognize. Some of the brass objects probably would have survived, if buried, in relatively good shape. Cooper's metals off-put a type of salt that's really nasty to microbes. Cooper's objects themselves can act as a form of exceptional preservation to things that they touch in buried sites. The natural transformations in a jungle site would be particularly harsh. In general, life is bad for archaeological site formations. Animals, plants, insects, and microbial organisms are the number one destroyer of artifacts, especially organic ones. Jungles are pure, unadulterated life. It's my professional opinion that this site, like almost everyone we see in Uncharted, is complete bullshit. But it's really fun bullshit. I don't want you to think I'm a killjoy. I understand why games like Uncharted lie to us about this. Archaeology is cool, and you must think so because you're watching this dumb video. By the way, like and subscribe and leave a comment while you're at it. It really helps a lot, actually. Even better, consider sharing this video with people you think might like it. If you stick around to the end of the video, I'll have some discussion prompts for the comment section. But archaeological sites require years of training and experience to even recognize. 
To really interpret an archaeological site takes tremendous amounts of knowledge and confidence. It's frankly overwhelming sometimes how complex sites can be to a trained eye, while they would ironically just look like a bunch of dirt to an untrained eye. It's more exciting, more romantic, to think that deadly traps made of wood and iron and rope would still stand hundreds of years after their creation, waiting for a hunky but hapless adventurer to step in the wrong place. It's thrilling to think that if we just squeeze through that gap, we can find a preserved place that looks like it was abandoned yesterday and not a millennium ago. To think we could be the first to lay eyes upon a place last viewed by its creators and marvel at its pristine beauty. Games lie to us because lies, it turns out, are a hell of a lot more fun. Okay, I said if you stuck around at the end of the video, I'd have some discussion prompts. So, this is your homework section. Some questions for the comment section. Is it okay that games portray archaeological spaces like this? What are the potential costs of doing so? Do you think games should be more upfront about their portrayal of these spaces? And if so, how might they go about doing this? All right, everybody. Thanks for joining me, and I'll see you next time.